Coming up on the Making Waves VO podcast. Here's the here's the rub, though. The people that think through their auditions for a minute, those are the ones that are more attractive. Those are the ones whose auditions are better. And everybody is always looking for the good work. They'll stop listening to auditions when they get the thing that they want. But they're still looking for the good read, the good work. Making waves. 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 This is the Making Waves VO Podcast with Kevin Kilpatrick and Bobby Maxwell. Welcome to the Making Waves VO Podcast. I'm Bobby Maxwell, and a little bit of a change up this week, you know. Emergencies happen, and it's summertime, and Kevin had to take the day off. So who do we punt to? One of our favorite VO guys in the world, <laughs> Rob Reed. Hi. Hey, it's actually just me, Kevin, doing an impression of Rob Reed. How, <laughs> how's this sound? I, it's, a, I, it's brand new for me. <laughs> right. You've done this podcast thing before. You've actually been on a guest on our podcast a couple of times. So hey, if you keep at it, you might be like, you know, Jay Leno and take over for the real deal. Right? Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, anyway, the Making Waves VO podcast is brought to you by Full Compass and FullCompass.com. We know VO. All right. Well, we are going to be talking today, and we'll bring him right into the uh, the room here, the Zoom room. Um, someone that we have both coached with, yeah. right, Rob? Yes, absolutely. In fact, we were in a, a, a workshop webinar with him, and then I think we've each individually coached with him as well. So, yeah, not a stranger yeah. to us at all. No, not at all. So let's bring into the Zoom room Hugh Klitsky. Hey, Hugh, how are you? Hey, kids. How's it going? <laughs> kids. <laughs> Rob, Rob, he calls me Bob. 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 I love it. I like you know, it. He, he calls me sexy grandpa, so you know it's exactly. <laughs> now it's the Robin Bob show. Come on! <laughs> oh whoa! Maybe Kevin is going to be kicked off. That's wrong. That's so wrong. That's like such low hanging fruit. Oh my god, that's so easy. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, gosh, you have done a little bit of everything in voiceover. So we need to know your background story. We know that you were a director for a very, very large New York talent agency. Are you able to say who it was? Sure, sure, yeah. I spent almost 15 years as the voiceover studio manager at Buckwald in New York City. Ooh, mm. we're not worthy. <laughs> How did you get into that to begin with? How did... I, it, was a, it was an accident. It was like like a lot of things around that time at the, in, the mid, in the mid early 2000s, you know? I was looking to find something better for myself than the day job I had at the time. The day job I had at the time was selling cell phones at Radio Shack. Oh. So you can so you can imagine in 2005 that the it was an, somebody put up an article saying if you took the money you would spend on an iPod at that time and had used it to buy Apple common stock at this point, that stock would be worth hundreds of thousands of dollars at this point. That's how different the times and the economy and the and all kinds of entertainment business were then. And I fell into voiceover because I had scored somebody's film. He could not afford to pay me. And I said, that's okay. I'm looking for a better day job than the one I have. This has been a great distraction from the current situation that I'm in. And I said, I don't even know if you can help me with this, but can you refer me to something else? And he looked at me and he said, okay, what about my old job? And I said, I don't know what you do. Turned out that he had just quit being the studio manager, the voiceover studio manager at Buckwall. And so wow. he set me up with a, uh, I was about to say an audition. He set me up with an interview and I got interviewed on a Friday at nine in the morning. And they hired me at three o'clock in the afternoon. And I said, okay, this sounds great. Now, what am I going to do? Because <laughs> I had no idea about the industry, no idea about the business. You know, I was an overeducated 
I don't know how to describe it, an overeducated musician, having done a variety of music jobs within the industry, everything from touring with Penn and Teller as their head of sound to assisting a Baroque trumpet scholar to being an assistant for an orchestrator with a relationship with the Cole Porter Trust for a new ballet for American Ballet Theater, all kinds of different things at that point. And the idea of having something steady and consistent was really, really attractive. And it had a life expectancy, an expected life expectancy of about a year and a half. That's how long anybody usually lasted in the position because they got tired of listening to the same script read over and over again. And I left 15 years later, almost 15 years later. Wow. I got, I got very into really understanding how voice talent work and really understanding Every single voice talent was different. And quickly I began to pay more attention to the way they were doing the work rather than the work itself. And I found that to be intensely interesting and I still do to this day. So, you know, my father at the, at the time before I left, he said to me, you might get a different kind of satisfaction working with people for a longer period of time rather than the short bursts that you're doing with people at Buckwald. I mean, at Buckwald, I could see 60 people in a day. The most people I saw in a day was 89 people in a single day. I had no assistants, no interns, nothing. And I directed hundreds of thousands of auditions by the time that I left. So transitioning into coaching and classes and demo production was a lateral move, but it it's different and I appreciate it in a very different way. I work with talent and I bring them into a different space and I really enjoy it. You don't want to miss what's next. Making Waves returns momentarily. Hello, everybody. This is Dave Walsh of The True Tell and you're listening to the Making Waves VO podcast with my friends, Kevin Kilpatrick and Bobby Maxwell. Oh, Bobby, you know, vacation season is upon us. A lot of people are going to be going on vacation and a lot of us voice actors need to take travel gear with us. And good thing our friends at Full Compass have everything you need for traveling, like the iRig. Bobby, you know about the iRig, right? I do know about the iRig, but I am an Android person. But you have an iPhone, right? Yes, I have an iPhone, and, and a lot of people do have an iPhone. And if you go to fullcompass.com, just go into their search and just type in iRig, all one word, and all the products come up, and you're gonna see all the different varieties of iRig things they have, which are great for traveling. They're compact, they're portable, they provide you with good quality sound. If you need something small and compact, and in sometimes emergency situations, they're gonna have it for you at Full Compass. Yeah, speaking of compact, um, I use the Focusrite uh, I, for the road, the Scarlet, and it's just so tiny. I can put all of my gear in just a little carry-on case that I kind of shove underneath my feet on the plane. So they have the Scarlet, they have the 2i2, the 3i3. I mean, they've got just about every Focusrite product you can imagine at Full Compass. I love the Focusrite myself because like you said, it's compact and it is my go-to uh, interface to take with me when I'm traveling. But if you're not traveling and you're more concerned about, hey, what are some long-term solutions for my sound, Kev? I'll tell you, Oralex products. Oralex are, I, I, I think they're the best, right? Yeah, they are really good. There are some other uh, comparable uh, products for treating sound. And now when we're talking about Oralex products, we're not talking about blocking out sound so much, but absorbing that echo sound mm -hmm. that you might get in an untreated space. And here's the good news. Uh, for a limited time, Full Compass has some Oralex products on sale. So again, go to the search bar in the, the Full Compass page and type in Oralex. Let me do it right now so I can do it along with you. A-U-R-A-L-E-X, Oralex. And all these wonderful products come up. Pages and pages of wonderful products. 
and some of them, Bobby, are on sale. Ooh. Well, you know, uh, Full Compass always has the low price guarantee, so that's always a great thing. They have free shipping on anything over $49, which if you're getting a whole road gear kit, you know, that's covered right there. And they always have their friendly free expert assistance at Full Compass. Call them at 1-800-356-5844 and talk to a sales consultant. Or go to fullcompass.com. Full Compass, fullcompass.com. We know B.O. Making Waves returns. So Rob and I are both, I, I wouldn't say we're new, but we haven't been doing this as long as a lot of the veterans in the industry. Right, Rob? Yeah. Yeah, I, I would say that's fair. That, I, that's fair. So we we didn't experience going to an agency and doing our auditions. Yeah, yeah. That had a lot of benefits to it. It had a whole lot of benefits to it. A friend of mine looked back and she was showing me her early notes and the early training that she was getting back in 2002. And she was saying to me how in New York City, nobody taught voiceover practically. And that it was really a craft that was very much on the job training where you really learned from the casting directors who, who talent were brought in and the goal was that the casting director's responsibility was to get exactly what the agencies wanted. So they, uh, the, let me spell that out clearly. The casting directors brought in talent from the talent agencies and the casting directors were beholden to the advertising agencies to say, I'm gonna give you 15 people from all of these different talent agencies that are going to fill the description that you have given me. So then they were responsible for getting that sound out of them. So the voice talent then were coached on site by the casting directors to get the sound to bring back into the talent, the commercial agencies for them to make their decision. Was that clear as mud? I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Was that clear? I don't want to, I'm trying not to uh, befuddle the issue that way. No, it does sound complicated. <laughs> Unfortunately. And then as the and then as the industry began to diversify, then people began to realize, oh, voiceover is a thing I could get taught to do. It wasn't just a matter of on the job training. So then yeah. people began to offer workshops for the first time. And that really started around 2005, 2006. And now the landscape for that has changed completely in the 15, 20 years almost since then where there's just so many different educational opportunities. It's completely different. Yeah, a lot. Yeah, all outside of the standard acting schools and things like that, that way. Voice talent also learned from each other. Voice over talent have always been a very congenial lot. They've always gotten along and enjoyed each other's company. So in the waiting rooms, they would work with each other before actually going in to record their auditions for those casting directors. So there was a lot of learning in the third space that way, the space that's not quite work and not quite home, but when they had to sit and wait for that studio to become available that, to have that appointment, they would learn from each other. And that's missing a lot in the virtual world. Now, some of that slack has been picked up by workout groups and peer led mm -hmm. groups that way. But still, it doesn't quite have that direct line of feed from the casting director to them that way. So that's part of what I do when I coach people in group sessions, for example, I kind of fill the role that those casting directors used to. And my own experience as a casting director coming to the fore that way to say, how do I talk to this person in front of me to get the sound that they're looking for? It's a fine line between direction and coaching at that moment. I always say I would love to have Hugh over my shoulder <laughs> every minute of every day, but that could get pretty expensive. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, what, it's one of the other things that made it interesting when I read your background before I went to your workshop, Hugh, was was the difference in in getting coached or taking lessons or whatever you want to call it. Um, the difference between a uh, booth director who was actually coaching uh, talent through the audition and a casting director and a f 
maybe a, a former successful VO, you know, a voice actor themselves. Talk a little bit about the difference that you, the insight and the difference that you bring to the table when it comes to somebody that hires you for coaching. I think that a voice talent can be a fine, fine teacher. Mm -hmm. And yet they know how to do the work from their own, from their own perspective first. This is the way that they learn to succeed. This is the way they in particular approach the craft of the work. That's great. Yeah, that's great. A casting director, a booth director had to stare at 20 people and get this a high quality result out of 20 different people. So you got to know how to talk to 20 different people to get that that kind of result. So it's a different skill set, but it helps to know it helps to know the point of view of your of your coach to say, are they coming from a directing background? Are they coming from a coaching background? Are they coming from the agent world? Are they coming from the talent world? And then to say, this is why they're speaking to me this way. And does that me, does that inform me as the voice talent in a particular way? This is Heather Bell, voice actor, and I can tell you, you've made an awesome choice listening to the Making Waves VO podcast with Kevin Kilpatrick and Bobby Maxwell. I know you're going to enjoy it. Can you tell, if, if we didn't tell you what our background was, can you tell just by us reading right away, if we came from radio or if we came from on camera or a theater background or totally newbie to voiceover somewhat yeah what like the the radio sound for the most part or at least some kind of a broadcast sound whether it was radio or whether it was maybe uh news those are kind of similar that way Mm -hmm. acting is different there's a, a certain subtlety to it but actors sometimes are a little bit unwilling to like land the like a brand when they have to you know, right, they sometimes, yeah. you know, shy away from things like that a little bit, which has a lo- which can have a lot of value in the marketplace. Each one of those is different. But I mean, like if you tried to blindfold me and say, OK, they're going to read for you, Hugh, and you got to guess, I, <laughs> I might be a little bit better than average, but still it would be <laughs> challenging. <laughs> Speaking of, of landing the brands, how, how have the reads changed? Um, when it comes to uh, specs for commercial jobs and and trends, it seems like that's always a hot topic on lots of podcasts, lots of workout groups, uh, the trends in the reads. How much have those changed over over your time? Well, how far back do you want to go? I mean, <laughs> I mean, if you go back to like pre nine eleven, like pre nine eleven, I'm not. Sh- I I wasn't involved pre nine eleven um, so much, but I I did hear the stories. I did hear the stories a bit and I did understand that there was a change and I was like in the middle of the biggest parts of that change. Again, that year, 2006, right? Facebook hadn't happened. Right. And YouTube was in its infancy. So media, the media landscape hadn't converted. Mm -hmm. So they weren't watching us the same way. We weren't being advertised to buy media the same way. The way I think about it is that around 2009, 2010 or thereabouts, as that really began to ramp up and become a real thing, suddenly the conversation in the sales marketplace fragmented to where suddenly it was no longer one announcer voice at the top of the mountain trying to reach as many people as possible it became a series of small conversations. Right. And then suddenly it was peers talking to peers. So then the reads had to reflect that. But the writing of copy didn't change. Why? Because the writing of the copy had been basically perfected for a long time. Because voiceover copy is written in very, in a very, very specific way. It's designed to be heard once and understood immediately with no take backs. So when people complain and say, well, if they want it to not sound announcery, they have to write it the way people talk. No, they shouldn't write it the way people talk. 
because people like listening to me in this podcast, right? Talking roundabout, redundant, nonsensical ways, <laughs> right? Transcribe this and this is going to be a mess, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> but commercials have to be concise. They have to be clear. They have to be specific. And so the point is to be able to speak them in a way that's so natural and so fluid, people are unaware of the artificiality of the words. That's something of a new challenge for the voiceover actor. Not that new. Let's, let's not kid ourselves. It's not that new. That's been the request for 15 plus years, almost 20 years at this point, for that particular reason. The narrative dialogue has changed. Yeah, explain to you and I have talked about this before. You, the the narrative structure. You said there's a difference between explicit and implicit. Sure, sure. Uh, Bobby's studying with me right now, privately, and uh, today we were talking a little bit about the difference between the way the words are laid out on the paper, specifically the language, the way things are organized into groups of three and triptychs where brands are placed in uh, the story of the 30 second commercial, where brand names are placed, where certain emotional ideas are. And that when you look at a script, you can directly look at it and say, oh, there's a group of three phrases working together. And those three phrases in that triptych have a relationship to each other. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see, I see those three phrases. The, seeing three phrases is explicit. It's right there. The relationship between those three phrases is implicit to say, is this just a list of three examples? Or is this a list of ideas where each one is better and it goes from good to better to best? Or is it in these three phrases, this one is not as good and these two are a lot better. All those ideas are implicit ideas. So the goal for the voice actor needs to be I see the architecture here in a, in a clear map right here on the page, but here's the terrain that's implicit in that narrative, in that structure. And those are two different things. One requires you know, the ability to see it, and the other one requires the ability to emotionally interpret it and make sense of it. One is very objective, the other is very subjective. Definitely. So you really you're basically you're saying there's so much and, and this is I think standard coaching too uh, but you go into it a little bit more um, that we can't just what what is the one that I put up on the wall today the run and gun is that what you call it oh you can't just run and gun yeah you yeah. can't yeah. just you can't just you know pile onto the mic and just you know rattle you know run and read and hit record and then hit send right away you got to take a minute and think about it you got to take a minute and to just look at the script and understand the layout and understand the emotions in there just a bit. And then you can press record, but you can't, you can't just run and gun. Yeah. The, the, the people who are just coming into the business or, you know, have been in it for five, 10 years, whatever, um, we're seeing on social media or workshops or the conferences that, you know, especially pay to play, you know, the statistics, um, I'm going to book, you know, one out of every 100 auditions or something like that. And somebody goes, well, I only do five, you know, a day or something like that. So don't you think that is really taking away from what you just said? I mean, they're going to want to get it done quickly. So they're not going to, and, and it probably goes back to you in the booth directing because, those people were coming into the agency because there was one audition as opposed to looking at, you know, 50 for the day, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. You're talking about the urgency to get something in, knowing that you're competing with a thousand people at all points all around the country. Mm -hmm. And that at the moment that you're first on the list, the odds are much, much stronger that you're going to get it. Here's the, here's the rub though. The people that think through their auditions for a minute, those are the ones that are more attractive. Those are the ones whose auditions are better. And everybody is always looking for the good work. They'll stop listening to auditions when they get the thing that they want, but they're still looking for the good read, the good work. Does it take time? Sure. Developing a process about how you do the work is the thing that allows you to 
do the work faster and more efficiently with high quality. You want to hear a strange example that just popped into my head? Yeah. There's a video of Pablo Picasso painting on a sheet of glass. And when you watch him do it, it's fascinating to watch him essentially improvising with a paintbrush on a piece of glass where he's instantly making art and he's painting and drawing on it and then drawing over it. And it's becoming all of these different images at once. That's a man with a lifetime of skill who is made, able to make something instantly and quickly and something that's captured in that moment because he's put the time in to develop a skill set that immediately transfers into the medium that he's working in. And the finest people who do any craft make it look easy because they put the time in and the new task that's in front of them, they then can apply their full skill set to immediately and the work is at a very high quality. Mm. You don't have to be at the level of a Picasso to compete in the voiceover world, but you do have to have a skill set. You have to have a, a set of skills, a process to apply. Otherwise, you constantly feel like you're starting from zero or you're just a, a machine churning out con consistent, bland, subpar work. And now AI can do that faster than you ever could. Mm -hmm. So that's what you're up against now. There's a machine that exists that can produce work at a reasonably high quality. But if you want to do compelling work, you want to do engaging work, you have to develop your skill set to harness the emotions inside of you to bring that to the copy. Hang around. We'll be back shortly. Ah, you're listening to the Making Waves VO podcast with Kevin Kilpatrick and Bobby Maxwell. Me? Oh, I'm Joe Cipriano, and I'm here for the popcorn. As a voice actor, you want to focus on what's important, right? Like pulling off the perfect read. You don't want to stress about tech stuff. That's why Full Compass is in your corner. With 50 years experience in pro audio, Full Compass has everything we voice actors need. Mics, headphones, monitors, mixers, interfaces, DAWs, all the goodies. And their certified product experts help with everything they sell. Plus, you can get free same day shipping, flexible financing, oh, and a low price guarantee. See it all at fullcompass.com. Fullcompass.com. They know VO. And now back to making waves. Do you have a you have a uh, acting background at all yourself? You have you, you have a video on your website that like the 20 questions or 50 questions quickly. And you really come off as an actor on that. <laughs> <laughs> There's a certain there's a certain showiness to uh, standing and lecturing, for sure. Yeah, but explicitly an acting background, no, no. I do come from a family of teachers, which means I do know how to stand up in front of a group of people and do things that way within those particular parameters. And so that's what some of that is in both of those videos that way. Mom was a school nurse and, and president of the union. Dad was a high school science teacher. My big sister just retired. She was an elementary school teacher for 20 plus years. My big brother does IT for one of the seven sisters colleges up in Massachusetts. And I have a degree in music education K through 12. And I taught music theory to undergraduates um, at SUNY Purchase when I went there. And then you went rogue. <laughs> and then I went and then I went rogue. Exactly. No, I've always kind of gone, you know, back and forth that way, you know, a little bit. But I I have the teaching, the teaching gene, shall we say? Yeah. But no, that's uh, very flattering of you to say that. Thank you. You're very welcome. So your website, uh, Conversational VO, um, it couldn't have been better timing. When did you come up with that? I was, it was like th two years ago that. I was what do you call it, that URL kind of fell in my lap. You know, my friend Deb Irwin gave me that, what do you call it? She said, that's available. You want that? And I said, okay, yeah. And then when I casually mentioned it to some folks, they were like, that's pretty good. 
The conversational read, though, was something that I had begun to coach specifically before that. When I went out on my own, um, I would do a, you know, a, a, what do you call it? A, a complimentary consultation with people, you know, and I would say to them, uh, what are you looking for in a coach? Because I really wanted to know. I always thought that I would be like, just like coaching commercial. And that would be like pretty straightforward that way. And I was surprised at the number of people who said, I've always wanted to land the conversational read. And they went deeper with it. And they said, hey, I make a good living doing uh, industrial reads, medical narration, uh, non-broadcast work but I've never really landed the conversational read. Can you help me with that? And I began to hear that enough that I began to really pay attention to it. And then I thought about it and I said, yeah, okay, sure, sure. And then I had a terrific chance encounter with a speech pathologist out of Boston. Her specialty, ready? Hang on tight, here it comes, right? Her specialty was to coach non-native English speakers to modify their native accents so that native English speakers would not be distracted by the artifacts from their first tongue. Wow. That romance languages, for example, have a different relationship between the adjective and the noun. But English is a Germanic language. So when we hear a romance language speaker speak English, they're stressing their nouns and adjectives in different ways than we're used to. Mm -hmm. So she would coach them to say, don't stress this word, stress that word. Don't use pitch so much for emphasis. Soften the consonant, shorten the vowel. Doesn't that sound like things I said to you guys in coaching? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Right? Certain yeah. ideas. And so I began to say, okay, if she can take the prosody of English and talk about it this way, I can take the prosody of the announcer read and then tell people and coach people how to modify the sound to get towards more of a conversational read, along with ideas of adding subtext. So it became a way for me to talk about the sound of speech as well as talking about the acting of speech with intention. And you put those two things together and that's what I talk about all day long. What do you think are some of the, the biggest stumbling blocks that talent do have with conversational VO? There's an epidemic of bad smiling where people sometimes smile too brightly and too <laughs> consistently as opposed <laughs> to, what's that, Bob? I said, hello. <laughs> <laughs> now, radio, folks, radio folks are uh, taught to smile all the time, right? And it gets to a point sometimes where it can feel very artificial and feel too bright or feel too smiley, as opposed to allowing the smile to inform the story. That's one thing, right? There's a tendency to hit individual words rather than to think and speak in long phrases. In the conversational read, we speak in very long phrases very, very naturally. That's something that Americans do. We also soften our consonants in a way that announcers don't. Announcers tend to have fairly hard consonants. And so I say to them, hey, soften your consonant and allow the words to push together a bit and then feel what that does to your ability to phrase a single long idea. I think Rob, you and I talked about that. I yeah, think. yeah, that's yeah, and yeah. and that and that's that part of it is one of the, I guess for me with the radio background, is why I have such a difficult time with that, and I think if I had to pick out one singletary thing that 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 challenges me more than anything is the breathing and the long phrases, mm. mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. makes that and that makes my read come across as an answery, right? Mm. Right? Mm -hmm. That, a bit of that using pitch for emphasis, that kind of sing-song quality in the phrase, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? It's not that we don't use pitch for emphasis. We do, but we don't use it as far and as hard 
as say somebody you know who's done radio for their entire career yeah or somebody you know who grew up speaking farsi for example that's a very melodic language then when they start to speak english they naturally phrase with big big up and down sounds mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well americans don't do that we're much much more subtle Hello, this is Tom Pinto, voice actor and coach. And whenever I'm done listening to myself, I listen to Kevin Kilpatrick and Bobby Maxwell, the hosts with the most. Now, there's a trend now towards, oh, let's get away from the conversational read. We, we want things to be a little bit more announcery. And I'm like, cool, all for it. Rock on, rock on. But do you know what you're talking about? Yes, radio people got a little excited about that, didn't we, Rob? Yeah. <laughs> the, the announcer read is coming back. It's like, woo, Can't finally. Sit still. <laughs> but it's but it's an it's now a read of, of a different kind of engagement where, you know, as somebody said to me, oh good, we get to sound like we like things again. Mm -hmm. Right? Where we're allowed to be enthusiastic and appreciative and to allow that to show as opposed to, oh, we're just gonna back off a little bit and, and downplay and underplay right now. I've seen the conversational read go from not announcery to conversational to a real person read to an actory read to a real read to not sounding like a voiceover talent at all. All of these words have been used to describe different facets of the non announcer read. Oh, you forgot that I don't give a crap read too. All right, and the I don't and the I don't give a fuck read. Yeah, right, right, right. The the I D A G F where it's buy the diamond <laughs> or don't. It's fine. We don't care. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's that. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. But now we're starting to be able to like things again. Cool. Great. Do that. But you're not doing a hard announcer sell either. Don't you think that had a lot to do with COVID too? I think that in COVID, there was that trend initially of, hey, we're all in this together, right? Where things began to get, you know, be, we need to be very soothing and very supportive and very mm -hmm. careful. And then I think the pendulum kind of swung in a different direction. And now it's kind of swinging back. But I think that that along with the economic unrest and the overall lack of confidence and the question of where do I, where do I point the finger for the consumer. It's like, who's responsible for the fact that these things are more expensive? I've got a job, but my money doesn't go as far, but I've got a job. That's somebody's fault. It's not my fault. Is it a corporation's fault? And yeah. the corporations are like, it's okay. It's okay. Spend the money. You have more coming. You've got a job. It's all right. Fine. It's, it's challenging. Do I think it's COVID? Part of it. Do I think it's all that? No. Do I think that American consumers are now more informed than at any other point in history? Yeah. Do I also think that there's a lot more information being thrown at them than ever before? Yep. Do I think it's easy to hide in the noise floor of all the ideas that are being thrown at you? You bet. Sometimes it's just about, you know, louder and more to distract you when you've still got to go out and, you know, make a living and buy the groceries and all that. So yes, I think it's a lot of things happening at once right now. So it's very difficult to tell exactly where all of this is going. And then marry that with AI coming in, and then it gets even more complicated that way. So what's on the horizon for Hugh Klitsky and VO? What, what do you got coming up? Well, I'm starting uh, something new. And I'm kind of curious to see uh, the way that it shakes out. Uh, there's a tradition in music education called the open studio where a let's say a piano teacher has a studio of let's say 15 students and then maybe two or three hours a week they will basically have an open lesson where they'll have a student and the teacher and in a classroom you'll be able to come in and observe someone else being taught interesting and I think that's an intensely interesting idea. It's different than the idea of coming in with a group of people and getting critiqued one-on-one. -on -one. It's an idea where it would be come in and observe 
somebody actually going through the process of being coached. So the format I'm thinking about is say, in a 45 minute session, five minutes of introduction, a 30 minute lesson where you would be able to come in and observe someone else actually being taught and then 10 minutes of Q&A at the end. And I'm, and I'm hoping to roll this out in September with a really nice, large uh, kind of splash with it. I'm very curious about the idea of doing it four times in an eight week session, maybe even six times in a 12 week period, starting in the fall, where it would be like, doing it once, two weeks later, doing it again with somebody else, two weeks later, doing it with somebody else, just to announce it and go big. I like going big. I like, I, I take a certain amount of pride in, in big numbers. I love that I've done, oh, I don't know, maybe like between the end of last year and this year or a hundred plus consults that way. And I've done like 60 since of them since Bio Atlanta in March, probably more like 150 consultations that way, you know? Where you can go to my website and you can sign up for a free 30 minutes with me. And then you can just have a chat and get critiqued and then talk about the work and where you are with it and then talk to me about it. So those are the two things that I've got going on. The free consults at conversationalvo.com that anybody can sign up with. And for the first time, people are coming to me through Google. So I'm pretty stoked about that as opposed to from direct referrals from cool folks like both of you. And also this uh, new initiative I'm putting together for Open Studio. And then coupled with that, um, I wanna get together well-organized small group coaching because I know that there are people who like to learn in groups. So I'm very interested in organizing that where it would be working professionals in a small group of six with other working professionals because those folks need to be talked to in a particular specific way, as opposed to people who are perhaps part-time, as opposed to people who are still in training. So I'm also looking to set up a way to organize folks for that also in the fall at the same time as organizing Open Studio. Open Studio, I'm looking to do that for free and to invite anybody who wants to come in and observe and ask questions. I love that. You know, it'd be really cool. Do it live in New York and give us reason to go to New York for a weekend. <laughs> we could do that. We could do that at Opera in America. That'd be a blast. You know, they've got a big, you know, space to do something like that in, you know, or, you know, any of the, the big studio spaces that way. Yeah, I would love that. I would sign up in a heartbeat. Cool. Well, so you're you, gonna, the, yeah, uh, the inspiration behind the open studio um, is that something that came directly from other music studios where they're teaching or was this something that kind of was born out of uh, a VO experience? If, if you can give that away. Sure. I'm a, <laughs> give it away. I'm a really big believer in giving it all away. You know, yeah. you know, when Bobby set this up with me, she said, we're not going to, you don't have to give away the secret sauce or anything. And I made the joke, um, of course, I'm going to give away the secret sauce. Yes. You could have the whole menu, I think you said, or something yeah, like that. Yeah, you could have the whole menu. Why? You know, because, you know, if it all it took was reading a book, right? Every every single hopeful that got off the bus so just, should just read a copy of An Actor Prepares, right? And read a copy of How to Stop Acting by Guskin. I think that's a good book. And then they, or, you know, something by Uta Hagen, and then they totally clean up. No problems. And the first person I ever said that to suddenly stopped talking because they were like, right, right. It's not just about reading it. It's about applying it. It's about being shown how to do the yes. work too, yes. you yeah. know, that way. So the idea for Open Studio was me watching master teachers, mostly on YouTube and, yeah. and famous ones, like um, in their circles, for example, uh, Nadia Boulanger, the famous French pedagogue for composers who taught everybody from Leonard Bernstein to Quincy Jones to Aaron Copeland and, and to the guy that wrote the theme song for Sesame Street. Seriously. Mm. Wow. And there she is in black and white video at near the end of her life, running an open studio, teaching piano to a kid 
And there's a whole room of students there and she's actively teaching the student, occasionally looking up and addressing the group, teaching the student. And I couldn't quite figure out a way because I thought it was such an intriguing, an intriguing pedagogical idea. I'm like, yeah, I could totally see the value watching somebody else get taught mm -hmm. privately. But how do you do that in like the voiceover universe? Do you do it live in a booth and then there's only a certain number of people and then are they going to sit in the in a room? But, but then I thought about it more deeply and I said, you could do it on Zoom, mm -hmm. right? You could do it on Zoom. Instead of doing a an AMA, why not, you know, get coached live, which is that bit of introduction at the beginning, the 30 minutes in the middle. So it's not too long for anybody involved. And then 10 minutes at the end to take questions or, or whatever, to just have a different kind of engagement to really pull the curtain back and say, this is a way to see it and to experience it, you know, where it's like, yeah, that voice talent I've always admired, here they are getting into the, the dirt of their work. So interesting and just so different than them holding up and, and just talking about the work, seeing them do the work. And there's a bit of a, of a tightrope feeling to it that I think is very interesting that way from myself, but also from the talent too. Oh yeah, I could see some nerves there, but you gotta just let that go. And then you can flip it around too. And I said, there could be different variations on it. For example, instead of me supplying the scripts, what if somebody brought in scripts for me to see that I'd never seen before? Sure. Okay, I would do that, you know, for example. You know, here's what I wanna work on today, Hugh. Okay, cool, I've never seen this before, let's do it. You know, mm -hmm. and then, you know, having me step up that way. So I think the variations on it could be really interesting too. You know, what goes on with somebody who's, you know, has a certain level of success, what goes on with a beginner, you know, things like that. What are the challenges that they, that they deal with and they have to think about mm. like that? I, it just seems like such an intriguing notion that way. So I'm very excited about, you know, giving it a go. Again, it's still in the early stages, you know, this is what June, so shooting for September and you know, I'm excited that, you know, Bobby said she'd do it. And I've got a couple other fantastic folks who really on board with it. And yeah. I'm curious to see how this could work out. Yeah. And I think, you know, I think it's anybody that's ever worked with you um, in any kind of setting. And I, and I was one of those in, in, uh, in an early setting with you and Deb uh, a few years ago. And it was, a, it was, it was very unique. It wasn't anything like I had ever gone through before. And I think you're onto something very innovative right here as well. I can definitely uh, imagine the, <laughs> the benefits of this, this style. It, it would be attractive to me. I think I would learn, everybody learns obviously differently, right? Mm -hmm. Some people is all in their mind. Some people have to hear it. Some have to see it. And this kind of ties all of that together. Yeah, I, I'm very intrigued by it. Yeah. Very, very intrigued by it. I'm surprised that more people don't do it as often. Well, keep us posted, and or we'll just keep an eye on you at, at uh, conversationalvo.com. I'm sure you'll be announcing it there, right? Yeah, totally. Fingers crossed, you know. And then, you know, the, the newsletter is on the horizon, too, the stuff I wrote from 10 years ago, repurposing it for, you know, what goes on now. But the stuff I was writing back then was evergreen. So I'm looking forward to launching that again, too. But yeah, conversationalvo.com is where to find me. Exactly. And the the free consultation thing, that's right there and ready to go. It's the first big button down there on the bottom. I think it says something like on it, I'm in or something like that. I love that. Click on it and jump right to the calendar and go for it. Well, thanks, Hugh. This has been eye-opening. And uh, that, that's why I'm coaching with you right now. You have just very unique ideas. So thank you for... Sharon. No, you're welcome. Absolutely. Great to talk to you again, Rob. Yes, you as well. I, I was really excited to get the the call from the bullpen today. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way to put it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's great Thanks, to see Rob, you. Thanks, Rob, for for jumping in today too. My pleasure. Uh, Always. Yeah. So check out Hugh Klitsky at conversationalvo.com. And Kevin will be back next on the Making Waves VO podcast brought to you by Full Compass and fullcompass.com. Rob, say we know VO. Oh, 
We know VO. <laughs> I got. I got. To, you fired. You know, I know. Look at that. Jeez. <laughs> Slightly oh. more downturn on that. Let's just stick the landing a little bit more, Rob. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we know VO. Better? That's better. Okay, I like that good. one. <laughs> yeah, we'll use that one. Good job. Thanks, you. Thanks, Rob. You bet. The Making Waves VO podcast is produced by K2 Media Productions with hosts Kevin Gilpatrick and Bobby Maxwell. Sound design and editing by Jason Traver. Production assistance by Lacey Deline. Publicity and social media by Shannon Scott and Silas Phillips. Be sure to subscribe to the Making Waves VO podcast on your favorite platform. For all episodes, merchandise, gear, and more, visit makingwavesvo.com. Until next time, I'm AJ McKay. Keep making waves. <laughs>